بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين All praise is due to Allah We praise Him, we seek His help We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone for forgiveness and for His mercy We seek refuge in Allah from the evils of ourselves and from the evils of our wrong actions Whomsoever Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guides, none can lead astray. Whomsoever is left to go astray, none other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can guide them. I bear witness and I testify that there is no deity, no God worthy of worship except Allah. And I bear witness and I testify that Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his servant and final messenger. Brothers and sisters in Islam, dear listeners, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Today's topic, inshallah ta'ala, is entitled Choosing the Ideal Husband and Wife. Choosing the Ideal Husband and Wife. We know that from the Sunnah, from the way of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is to get married. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam specifically addressed the youth. He addressed the shabab. And he said, Ya ma'ashara shabab man istata'a minkum ulba'a fal yatazawwaj. He said, O oh youth, whoever can afford or whoever has the means to get married, should get married. Why? Fa'innahu aghaddu lil basar. Because it helps you lower your gaze and it protects your chastity, safeguards your chastity, maintains your modesty. Especially the youth, they have so much energy and so much desire when they are young. And Islam is against gazing at the opposite gender. Hence, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, He addresses the believers both males and females. And he says, قُلْ لِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ يَغُضُّ مِنْ أَبْصَارِهِمْ Say to the believers, to the believing males, to lower their gaze. And he says afterwards, قُلْ لِلْمُؤْمِنَاتِ يَغْضُضْنَ مِنْ أَبْصَارِهِنَّ Say to the believing females to lower their gaze. So one of the best ways to lower your gaze is to be married. It's through the institute of الزواج or النكاح. Now the word nikah means marriage, referring to the actual uh, marriage contract or the marriage ceremony. And the word nikah itself also refers to the act of intimacy between a husband and wife itself. So today inshallah ta'ala, I want to address the youth. I want to address the shabab. And in Islam... A shab or a shabba, a youth, is anybody between the age of puberty, roughly around the age of 15 to 33. Some ulama and some scholars, they even said up to 40. So specifically, I am addressing the youth. And today I also want to address the parents of these youth. So inshallah ta'ala, we want to give advice to both the youth who are about to get married and to their parents who are inshallah ta'ala helping their children find their other half or their better half. Now when you get married, we know that in Islam by getting married you complete half of your faith, half of your deen. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, إِذَا تَزَوَّجَ الْعَبْدُ فَقَدْ إِسْتَكْمَلَ نِصْفَ دِينِهِ فَلْيَتَّقِ اللَّهَ فِي مَا بَقِي That when the servant of Allah gets married, he has, in doing so, perfected or completed half of his deen. He should fear Allah, revere Allah with regards to the other half. You see, when you get married, you find yourself more focused. You find your feet you feel a sense of uh, responsibility. Your life has more meaning. So marriage adds more meaning to your life. Many, many benefits of getting married. And 
I want to stick to the topic of what are the things to look for in an ideal husband or an ideal wife. Now, the concept of marriage or nikah uh, from an Islamic perspective is summed up in one verse from the Quran. In Surah Al-Rum, chapter 30 from the Quran, verse 21, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He considered marriage as one of His ayat, one of His signs. وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ أَنْ خَلَقَ لَكُمْ مِنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ أَزْوَاجًا لِتَسْكُنُوا إِلَيْهَا وَجَعَلَ بَيْنَكُمْ مَوَدَّةً وَرَحْمَةً And from amongst His signs, is that He created for you spouses for you from your own kind as human beings so that you may live in tranquility with them Sakina so that you may live in tranquility with them and He has placed between you both in other words between the husband and wife Mawadda and Rahma love and mercy so there needs to be Mawadda and Rahma love and mercy between a husband and between a wife these are two very important foundations that need to be found in a relationship. When there is mawadda, when there is deep love, not just mahabba, mahabba is love, but mawadda is deep love. Mawadda and rahma, two fundamentals that ensure the success and the longevity of a relationship. Mawadda and Rahma means mercy. So these are two very important ingredients for a successful relationship, insha'Allah ta'ala. So today, my dear brothers, my dear sisters in Islam, we find that many of our youth are delaying marriage, not showing interest in it because either they are uh, pursuing their careers or their uh, individualism and they want to build for themselves they want a, a career a successful life and what we have to remind our youth is that true success and true happiness true contentment comes when you follow in the sunnah in the way of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as I said earlier, he addressed the youth. And he said, if you have the means, then you should get married. Now, the next question is, when does it become obligatory for a youth or for a person to get married? Now, in Islam, marriage can, become, can be either obligatory or it can be a mustahab, meaning it's desirable or it's a sunnah. It could be merely mubah, permissible. It could be a makruh. Makruh means it is uh, undesired or yani, um, it shouldn't, you shouldn't do it. Or it could be haram to get married. You see, these are the five ahkam of Islam. So for example, um, when it becomes, for example, sunnah, the scholars of fiqh, the scholars of Islamic jurisprudence, the fuqaha, they agree that if a person, that if a person seeks marriage with the intention of maintaining chastity and modesty, or with the purpose of producing more Muslims, that is from the uh, ibadat, acts of worship. They also agree that if through marriage a benefit comes about for the deen, then it is better than bachelorship, better than being a bachelor. And that marriage is recommended and, and desirable when one has the means to marry. It becomes wajib when you have the means to get married and you feel that you might be falling into zina if you don't. Now zina means a fornication. Fornication, zina. So in this case, if you are fearing the temptation, and yet you have the means, 
you can afford to get married. Here they said it becomes wajib for you to, for you to get married. Um, it becomes makruh or undesirable or not encouraged when a person does not have the means nor the desire for marital intimacy then it's not encouraged to get married in this to get married if you don't have the means and you um, there's no desire you don't fear falling into zina and it becomes haram for you to get married it is prohibited to seek marriage when one intends to cause harm or suffering to the spouse or is not going to be able to give their spouse their rights, fulfill their rights. So if you know that as a, as a male, by getting married, you're not able to spend on your wife. You are a, the type of person who you have an issue which you still haven't dealt with. Maybe you're a type of person when you get angry, you get very violent and you're still undergoing treatment for that. And you know that if your wife was to upset you, you'd become very aggressive. Then becomes. Then if you know that about yourself, that you have a certain condition, Islam is against oppressing others. Islam is against being unjust towards others. So you have to look at all of these things. So... If, if a person is financially capable of getting married and he is able to meet the rights and the obligations of their spouse and feels free from zina, then in this case, for example, becomes mustahab, desirable. But if, for example, the person is financially able to get married, this is talking about a male, and they are able to meet the rights of their spouse, their spouse, but is not free from zina, is very scared. You know, they, they feel that they might fall into haram, then in this case it becomes wajib. It becomes obligatory upon them to get married. Uh, it becomes haram to get married when you are not able financially to uh, provide for your wife and not able to meet their rights. And even though you feel you might fall into zina, now here, you have to do what? You have to now take measures for not falling into zina. And you can't get married in this case because you don't have the financial means. You don't have the ability to look after and fulfill the rights of your, of your spouse. Yet yes, you feel that you might fall into zina. Here the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, whoever is not able to, whoever cannot afford it, when he was addressing the youth, he said, فَعَلَيْهِ بِالصَّوْمِ he, should, he said he should fast. He should fast. This person should fast. Because when you fast, your desire is reduced. So the youth who feel falling into zina and they're not ready to get married, okay, they should take up measures. They should take up measures that will not allow them to fall into zina. And this is when um, we talk about things like don't look at the opposite gender. Don't be around the opposite gender. Don't go onto social websites where you are socializing with the opposite gender. You know, let's face it, a man and a woman cannot be friends. You know, often people ask this, can a man and a woman be friends? Well, you don't know what the other person is thinking. You, from your perspective, you think that you're a friend, whether you are a male or a female. But how do you know what they are thinking? And how do you know that shaitan isn't trying to make things deeper than your friendship? And I've personally asked a lot of youth, can a man and a woman be friends? And 99% of the time they tell you no. So that's why prevention is better than cure. Prevention. Don't put yourself in a situation where you might fall into haram. So my advice to the youth, number one, is keep away from social networks, social websites, whereby you are engaging with the opposite gender. Number two, get, keep yourself busy. Keep yourself busy with work. Keep yourself be, busy with your career, with your studies. That will take your mind of this, of wanting to be with the opposite gender. Also, fasting. 
as, as, he said, as we said earlier, the desire is reduced when you are in a state of fasting. Always be around people. Always be around, you know, brothers being around brothers and Islamic activities and lessons. So you need to do something about reducing that desire and not falling into haram. You can't say, hey, I'm going to fall into haram, I better get married. And you can't afford to get married and you can't give your wife her rights. So this is a, a very important um, piece of advice. So through marriage, one is able to find emotional stability. Through marriage, you become focused on the goals of life and you settle down and you know your position in the society you become psychologically and physically balanced one of the beautiful things about marriage it is one of the ways to gain hasanat one of the ways to gain reward because you are following in the command of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam you are following in the sunnah of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and when you are married, you are able to do certain things that will allow you to gain the reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So for example, in the hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said a dinar, a dinar is a currency. He said a dinar that you spend in the path of Allah, a dinar which you spend to free a slave, a dinar which you give a sadaqah to a needy person. He said, and a dinar which you spend on your family. The most superior, the best of these forms of spending. The best of these dinars is the one that you spend on your family. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Al-Aqrabuna awla bil ma'roof. That those who are near to you are most deserving of your good treatment. Of most are most deserving of your ma'roof, of your kind treatment, of your goodness. Subhanallah, even when you have intimate relations with your spouse, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, وَفِي بُضْعِ أَحَدِكُمْ sadaqa." That when you have marital relations, this is a form of sadaqah. This is a form of giving charity. The Sahaba radiallahu anhum wa ardahum, they were surprised at this statement. He said, Ya Rasulullah, a person fulfills his desire and he's rewarded for that. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, assume that he directed that desire in an unlawful manner through zina. Let's assume that he did this in a haram way. Will he not gain sin? Will, will he not have fallen into error and sin? They said, yes, Ya Rasulullah. And so the Prophet ﷺ said, therefore, when he directs it, in other words, that urge, that desire, in a way that is permissible with his wife, then he gets rewarded for it. So there are many opportunities. By getting married, there are many opportunities to gain reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to keep away from the haram. Marriage, my dear brothers and my dear sisters in Islam, preserves a person's morals, chastity and modesty. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not create us angels. You know, the angels, they have no desire. They just do as they have been commanded. They don't have, should we do it, shouldn't we do it? They don't have these emotions. They just do as they have been told. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when He spoke about the angels, He said, قُوْ أَنفُسَكُمْ وَأَهْلِيكُمْ نَارًا وَقُودُهَا النَّاسُ وَالْحِجَارَةِ عَلَيْهَا مَلَائِكَةٌ غِلَاظٌ شِدَادٌ لَا يَعْصُونَ اللَّهَ مَا أَمَرَهُمْ وَيَفْعَلُونَ مَا يُؤْمَرُونَ He said, he said protect yourselves and your families. You see, we have a duty to, to safeguard ourselves from the hellfire. أَنفُسَكُمْ وَأَهْلِيكُمْ And your families. نَارًا From what? From a fire. From a fire whose fuel is people in rocks. عَلَيْهَا Around this fire is malaika, Our angels. غِلَاذ شِدَاد they are, they are very stern. 
Firm. La ya'sun Allah. They do not disobey Allah. La ya'sun Allah ma amarahum. They do not disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with regards to what He has commanded them. وَيَفْعَلُونَ مَا يُؤْمَرُونَ And they do as they have been commanded to do. So Allah did not create us as angels. Allah did not create us as animals. Animals, they just do whatever they have to do. We are in between. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He wants us to derive pleasure from other human beings. And the highest form of pleasure on the physical level, on the physical level, can only be provided or achieved through the marital tie, through nikah and through marriage. That's the only way you're going to achieve it. There is uh, one other way which has its regulations, um, and that's to do with the amma, to do with the slave. And when Islam came, Islam came and regulated uh, the rules, regulated uh, when it came, placed regulations and rules when it came to those that do have slaves. Much of which is not applicable today because we, we don't live in uh, societies that um, have, uh, have slaves. But nevertheless, it should be said that if this does exist, then there are regulations that there are regulations in place when it comes to those who have uh, an amma, a slave, what the right hand possesses. So my dear brothers and my dear sisters in Islam, to be happily married begins with choosing the right spouse. You need to choose the right person. SubhanAllah, there is an Arabic proverb that says, it is better that you have 100 enemies outside of your home than to have one enemy inside of your home. Because your home needs to be a place of serenity. Remember what we said earlier in the verse in Surah Al-Rum? وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ أَنْ خَلَقَ لَكُمْ مِنْ أَنفُسِكُمْ أَزْوَاجًا لِتَسْكُنُوا Which means sakina, tranquility. So what we want to achieve in our homes is sakina. And hopefully we don't find the sakina. Does anyone know what the sakina is? The sakina is a knife. Yes, the sakina, the knife. Sakina, tranquility. That's what we want in our homes. So uh, he said sakina. So it's better to, to have Subhanallah, 100 enemies outside of your home and to have that one enemy in your home because your home needs to be a place of serenity, of tranquility, of happiness. Wallahu ja'ala lakum min buyutikum sakana. And Allah made from your homes a place of resting, sakina. So, we find that the institute, the institute of marriage in Islam is solid in theory. In theory, it's a very solid institute. But not as solid in application. When it comes to the reality, unfortunately, um, we find that many relationships are, are perturbed. Or there is... Yani, there are problems. There are problems in many Muslim homes. So, we have to be very, very careful. And we said, the prevent prevention is better than cure. And part of the prevention is ensuring that our youth marry the right people. That they marry the right person. So, Subhanallah, marriage is not like, you know, buying a car, if you don't like it, you can just, you know, uh, swap it, get rid of it, sell it, trade it in, buy another one. And that's what we find sometimes in some of our communities this is happening. That people are test driving their relationships. They're going on a test drive. 
And what they are doing, they are causing a lot of damage. They are causing a lot of distress, a lot of pressure on individuals, whether it's the spouse, whether it's the children, whether it's the imams, whether it's uh, whoever might be in that community that's dealing, having to deal with this. Now another question that often arises amongst many youth is at what age should you get married? Has Islam stipulated a certain age? Now what we do know is when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he addressed the youth, he said, whoever has the means. So the best answer would be when a person has the means, the financial means, the means to look after and to meet the uh, responsibility and to take ownership of being a husband or being a wife then that's when they should consider marriage. And the Prophet ﷺ, he said, whoever from amongst you can afford or has the means to get married. And so once you can meet those requirements, then you shouldn't spare a moment, okay? Especially in some circumstances, and get married insha'Allah ta'ala. So, what are some of the steps that Muslims can take to divorce proof, divorce proof their marriage? Especially that we find that in this day and age, especially amongst Western cultures, some 50% of marriages, they end up in divorce. 50% of marriages end up in divorce. And it's very important to, to ensure that you are choosing somebody who is going to be the ideal husband or the ideal wife. And today, unfortunately, um, many people have become very superficial in what they are looking for in a spouse. They are either looking for you know, their bank balances, or they are looking at how beautiful they are, or how muscular they are, or how buff, or how toned, or you know, the image. And these things do not last. These things do not last. And so living in the 21st century, we find and we are witnessing what we, know, what we call the body culture. People just, you know, Marrying because of looks, or because of image, or because of status. And not looking beyond the superficial characteristics, or saying, you know, I want for my daughter to marry a doctor. You know, why do you want your daughter to marry um, a doctor? And then, you know, they will say something like, you know, he can check her heartbeat when it becomes irregular. <laughs> so, it's about being happy with one another. And what brings about happiness uh, is, of course, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so let's talk about some of the things that we should be considering. Uh, when it comes to choosing uh, a husband, Let's begin for the sisters, choosing a husband. Of course, and this is um, not only for the husband, but also for the wife, when it comes to choosing a husband, you have to ask yourself, is there an attraction? That's, that's actually important as well. Now in saying that, when looking for a husband, um, to most women, um, that isn't something that is very, very important. There has to be some attraction, but you find that the other way around, that to a man, yes, it's important to most, to most men, we find that it's actually important for them, for the wife to be very attractive, to be in, in most cases, but not in the case of women. But attraction is definitely something to consider. At the time of the Prophet ﷺ, uh, one woman actually requested a, 
an annulment of, of her marriage on the basis that her husband uh, was not attractive, according to some reports. That her husband was not attractive, that she couldn't yani, be with him or give him his rights. So that is something definitely to consider. Now once you know that yes, there is an attraction there, you know, then what comes next would be looking at the person's deen. Looking at the person's deen. There's no point in looking at the deen and going, okay, okay, the deen is good, and then you look at the attraction. Well, there was no attraction to begin with. Let's just end it there. Otherwise, if you are going to go for the deen first, and, and then when it comes to the attraction, you say, no, it's like you've counseled him out for the deen. So, the Prophet ﷺ said, إِذَا جَاءَكُمْ مَنْ تَرْضَوْنَ دِينَهُ وَخُلُقَهُ فَزَوِّجُوهُ إِنْ لَمْ تَفْعَلُوا تَكُنْ فِتْنَةٌ فِي الْأَرْضِ وَفَسَادٌ كَبِيرٌ He said, if a suitor, if a man comes to you and you are pleased with his deen, and you are pleased with his akhlaq, with his manners, because there are some men, they have deen, but they don't have akhlaq, they don't have manners. So they'll pray five times a day, they fast Ramadan, they go to Hajj, they go to Umrah, they pay their zakat, they have a bead, they you know dress properly, but when it comes to their maybe their tongues, they are very filthy, their tongues very uh, uh, you know abusive, and they are known for that. So the Prophet Sallallahu in this hadith said, إِذَا جَاءَكُمْ مَنْ تَرْضَوْنَ دِينَهُ Somebody who you are happy with his deen, someone who you are happy with his manners, فَزَوِّجُهُ Give him in marriage. And if you do not do so, he said, if you do not do so, a harm and a great dest destruction will become rampant on the earth. This hadith is found in Tirmidhi and it is also uh, collected by Ibn Majah. So a woman should categorically refuse a man who does not have deen. If Islam is not a priority in his life, if Islam is not a priority in his life, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not a priority in his life, the pillars of Islam are not a priority in his life, then this is something which is very, very dangerous. Very dangerous. So just because he's a sweet talker, just because he looks good, just because he has a good personality, or he's a charmer, okay, all of that does not count if he doesn't have the deen. So this is the starting point. After you make sure that, yep, you're attracted to this person, yes, he has the deen, and then he has the akhlaq, he has the manners. So if you know, for example, he doesn't pray, he doesn't fast Ramadan, he drinks alcohol, or he's known to um, engage in illicit relationships or take um, prohibited substances. Okay, this is all very, very dangerous. The first thing a woman should ask for is, do you pray? Do you fast? How much does the deen mean to you? If you get a response whereby he is saying, he says to you, or you find out through a third party, that he doesn't pray, or that he doesn't fast, then straight away say, no thank you. Straight away. Don't allow yourself to go any further and then have an attachment. I sat with a lady the other day, a young girl with her mother, and she was in this very predicament whereby she had met a man and she knew from him that he doesn't pray. She asked him the question. As she asked all the other men that she's meeting for the sake of marriage. And then what happened, after she found out that he doesn't pray and he doesn't fast Ramadan and he's 30 years of age. Right, when you get to 30 years of age and you're not praying and you're not fasting and then she said to me, but he was so sweet, and he's so nice, and he's, you know, I really can get along with him. You know, we had to give her a reality talk. 
And then Alhamdulillah, she realized that this man is not for her. And she accepted this. And she yani, accepted that this is not the right, the right way to go. So don't take it further. Because then you're going to find it, especially as a woman that is very emotional, emotionally driven. You're going to find it very difficult to get out of this situation. You find your heart attached. Don't do this to yourself. You're hurting yourself. You're harming yourself. And you're putting your future up for destruction. So, this is really the, the starting point. A man, a man asked Hassan al-Basri, he said, several suitors have asked for my daughter in marriage. To whom should I give her? So, Hassan al-Basri rahimahullah ta'ala, he said, to him who is aware of his creator. For if he loves her, he will respect her. And even if he comes to dislike her, he will not be cruel to her. Because the one who is obedient to the Creator, the one who is obedient to the Creator, is more likely to be obedient to the created, and being good to the creation. But the one who is not good, doesn't have a good relationship with his Creator, how do you think he's going to be with the creation? So this is something uh, very important to consider. And as I said earlier, uh, character is very important. Now, how are you going to find out about the deen? How are you going to find out about the character? You can ask that person's friend, their teacher, their neighbor, someone who's traveled with them, um, somebody who studies with them, somebody who engages in business with them. Make an effort to do this. Don't quickly... Uh, make up your mind but take it that extra step inshallah ta'ala also what I advise the sisters is to look for somebody who is hard working someone who's going to be providing for you yesterday I spoke to another lady who was talking about a man whose wife is out working while he doesn't work and he's sitting at home and she has to go out and she has to work and he just sits there and he's not working and doesn't provide for the family. So um, make sure that, you, that he is actually um, working that is not uh, lazy. Now also what is important to, for females to consider is compatibility. That you are both on the same page. That you are both on the same page when it comes to your goals in life. When it comes to your interests. So how are you going to find out about compatibility? You're going to find out through communication. This is where you would come to the... Um, you would, the, the, there will be a meeting between you both in the presence of her wali, her guardian... And you will ask questions. And there are premarital questionnaires. I know I have a premarital questionnaire on my website. Um, some 100 questions you can ask each other about the different areas of life. What do you say about when it comes to the deen? About lessons, about uh, travel, about children. Where do you want your children to go? What type of schools? What about when it comes to finances? What about when it comes to social uh, gatherings? You might be a very social person. You meet someone who's not so social. Is that going to impact you? I came across another couple. And, you know, they were married. And one of the two, one of the, the, the two, uh, the couples, is not a social person at all, while the other one is. And this affected her very much. Because she grew up in a very social atmosphere and doesn't like to be, um, you know, isolated from social activities. Whereas her husband um, grew up in a more reserved, in a, he's more of an introvert, doesn't like to get out there. So that really affected her and she didn't like that. And was one of the reasons why she was considering moving on with her relationship and not being with this person anymore. So it's very important to find out what is it that you want. Maybe, 
Maybe you might end up marrying someone who loves travel, but you can't travel at all. And your spouse is very passionate about that. As for uh, choosing a wife, so we've given some heads up and some advice to the sisters. As for uh, choosing a wife, again, there needs to be attraction. You know, uh, women are more... Um, Women are more stimulated through their ears. Men are more stimulated through their eyes. So it is very important that you don't marry somebody that you're not attracted to. And this has happened also in our community. Individuals who said, look, you know, I married the sister because she has deen, she has akhlaq, she has, you know, beautiful things about her. I wasn't very attracted to her, but I thought, you know, who cares with time, maybe, you know, that, you know, I can just live with that. And then what happens? They end up getting divorced. Because that person compromised when it came to the attraction. So can you see how much damage now that causes another individual? This is, I'm talking to you from real life stories. I'm not talking to you from theories. People who I have interacted with, who've been in this situation. Whereby they said, I married for these other reasons, beautiful reasons, praiseworthy, praiseworthy reasons. But there was no attraction and down the track that just affected them too much. And of course it affected their spouse because they don't want their husband not to be attracted to them. And feel that, hey, he doesn't find me attractive. So yes, attraction is very important. And even at the time of the Prophet Wasallam. When one of the companions spoke to the Prophet ﷺ about a woman he was marrying or he had married, he said, did you look at her? He said, go and look at her. Because the eyes of the Ansar, there's something about the eyes of the Ansar, the women of the Ansar, they had small eyes. And most men are attracted to women with large eyes. So, it's very important that for there to be an attraction. Number one. Number two, of course, religion and the deen. It's still up there. But make sure you're attracted. When it comes to the deen, the Prophet ﷺ, he said, a woman is married for one of four reasons. He said, He said, a woman is either married for her wealth or for her status her lineage, or for her jamal, her, her beauty, or for uh, her religion, her deen. And then the Prophet ﷺ concluded and he said, go for the one with the deen, go for the one with the religion and you will prosper. You'll be happy, you'll be successful when you go for a woman who has religion. So now, you've met a woman who's attractive, who you are attracted to, because beauty now is in the eye of the beholder. You see something beautiful about this person that probably another person doesn't see. So, you have now you are happy with her taqwa and her uh, with her commitment to her deen. And the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he said that let each one of you take a heart that is grateful, a tongue that remembers Allah, and a believing wife who would assist him in regard to the affairs of the hereafter. So again, when it comes to also choosing a husband or choosing a wife, choose someone that's going to help you prosper and develop in your deen and help you to go to Jannah. Isn't that our primary goal in life? Isn't our primary goal in life to enter Jannah, to be admitted to the paradise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So that's something also that's very important to consider. Good character is also very important to consider. And the Prophet ﷺ, he said, amongst the sources of happiness are four things. And he mentioned one of them as being a good wife who pleases you when you look at her. And when you are away from her, you trust her in regard to herself and her property. And he said, and amongst the sources of misery, are an evil wife, that when you look at her, she dismays you. And he mentioned some other things in this hadith. Um, also, if a, a man has the choice between a married woman 
a previously married woman and a woman who is who has never experienced marriage then the preference should be towards a woman who has never experienced marriage before and the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said in the hadith that is found in tabarani he said marry virgins he said for indeed they have sweeter mouths nerve more fertile wombs and are satisfied with little you see they haven't been there and experienced this and that from so they're going to be content with what little you offer them especially if you know you're young and you don't have that much wealth so they're going to be satisfied more easily than a woman who's already experienced you know having lots of wealth and being um, uh, spoiled, spoiled in that way and as for having sweeter mouths there has been more than one interpretation regarding this and one of the interpretations um, is that you know they when it comes to their talk their talk is sweet okay um, and more fertile wombs and this is also the advice of Prophet ﷺ. he gave to Jabir ibn Abdullah um, who married a woman who was a non-virgin and uh, this hadith um, inshallah ta'ala you will find it in uh, Bukhari and Muslim um, another factor to consider is a woman who is able to have children. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, Tazawwaju al Wadud al Walud. Marry the woman who is loving. Wadud. Walud is she's able to have children. He said, Fi mukathirun bikum al al qiyamah. He said, For I will display your outnumbering of the other nations on the day of judgment. So part of the way that this Ummah that this nation of Islam will become a very large nation and the largest yani, following of any pro of the prophets of the past is by way of marriage. So yes, this is the priority. Um, and usually how do you know that a woman is able to have or to bear children through the history of the family? So if there's a history in the family of those family members not being able to have uh, children, then that's how you'll know the chances of this woman having children are also uh, decreased. Um, of course, a woman that has a loving attitude, as per the hadith that I just read, al-wadud, al-walud, the one who is loving, that's also very, very um, important for, for, for a husband. And of course, uh, likewise, uh, marrying a woman that you are compatible with that there is compatibility and again how are you going to find about that compatibility through a compatibility test like a pre-marital questionnaire where you ask the questions and you make sure you are on the same page you make sure you have a lot of yani, uh, similarities and you share the same goals in life one of the sayings of uh, an Arab of the old so this is not a hadith. He said, don't marry an annana. An annana is a woman who always is complaining, always whinging, you know, never satisfied. You know, so don't marry an annana. So we, want, we don't want our sisters as well to be, you know, to be always whinging and complaining. This is unattractive. He said, don't marry a manana. You know, always doing things for a favor. You know, always doing things as a favor to you. You know, I, you know, I cooked for you today, so you have to do this for me and that for me. I cleaned. I doing things as a favor. So um, he said, "Don't marry a Hanana. A Hanana um, is a woman who is a divorcee. And she's always thinking about her ex-husband. All right, always mentioning my ex-husband did this and my ex-husband did that." This is called a Hanan. If you have been divorced and you are remarried, do not mention your ex okay, to your uh, current husband. Don't mention the good qualities and always he did this and you, you do this and you know. And he said, don't marry a Haddaqa. You know, a Haddaqa is a woman who's going to send you broke. Everything she sees, you know, she wants to buy. This is called a Haddaqa, he said. Uh, from amongst the the things that you need to consider 
is you have to ask yourself um, certain questions about the person that you want to marry. Are they the type of person that you would like for your child to look up to and be like? So you have to ask yourself, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed you with a boy, do you want your son to be like that man? Or do you want your daughter to be like that woman? If the answer is yes, that's a good sign. If the answer is no, then you know that you need to consider somebody else. I know, one, I know of one story whereby a woman married a man purely because of his deen, his akhlaq. Yes, there was attraction, but she said, I really wanted my future boys, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala blessed me with a boy, to be like that man. That's what you have to ask yourself. Are you that person as well? You have to be that person. Now what's interesting to note also, when it comes to choosing a wife, okay, you often, when you ask the youth, when you ask the boys, the young men, you ask them, what type of wife do you want to marry? They will tell you, I want to marry a woman who is religious, you know, that she's modest and chaste. And him, he may have had like a hundred girlfriends, Okay, he may have been, he's probably one of the, he has a really bad, you know, history, bad attitude. Yet, every one of those boys will tell you, I want a good woman. That's how much, that's how important it is for a sister to be modest, to be chaste, to be uh, having good uh, deen, good akhlaq. Um, so basically, search for, when you're searching for a spouse, search for a mother, or for a father and not a babysitter for your child. Because many, children, many parents are just like babysitters. They're not that ideal father, that ideal mother. They're just like, they're just sort of supervising the children. That's it. You know, when you look at some of our greatest leaders, our greatest scholars, who were their parents? Their parents who raised, for example, Imam al-Bukhari. Imam al-Bukhari is known. Most authentic book of after the Qur'an is the Sahih of Bukhari. Who raised Imam al-Shafi'i. Who raised Imam Ahmad. And many of the elite scholars. Okay, they had very good parents. So always choose يعني, very wisely for your children. When a man came complaining about, a man came to Umar ibn al-Khattab when he was the leader. When he was the Khalifa, a man came complaining to Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu anhu wa arda about his son. And he said, my son is this, my son is that, he's disobedient to me. And so, he said, he went and he summoned the son and he spoke to the son. He said to him, but Amir al-Mu'mineen doesn't, don't I have rights also as a son? He said, yes, of course you do. He goes, what are, what are my rights? And he mentioned to him some rights. And he said, one of the rights is that he chooses a good mother for you. That means he should have chosen a good... He said, my father is married... Okay, my father is married to... Uh, 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 I think it was a fire worshipper or a magian. So, then Umar goes to the father and said, you have, you have يعني, done injustice to your son before he has done injustice to you. By you not choosing a right mother for him. So, let's remember... This. Also, from amongst the questions you should consider, are you happy with the way you are now? Or with the way they are now, sorry, the way that this, this, this potential spouse is now? Or are you hoping that they will change? So, in other words, don't marry potential. Don't gamble. Don't say, well, there's a good chance that they will change. No, there isn't a good chance. That's who they are now. How do you know they won't change for the worse? Don't gamble when it comes to your marriage, when it comes to your future. Um, also, can you see yourself with this person 30 years from now? Don't think short term. Yes, the biceps and the figure and the attraction and the appearance and the, the looks. Think long term. Do you feel calm? Do you feel at peace? Do you feel relaxed with that person? That's also very important. Likewise, can you 
fully be yourself and express yourself with this person? Or does this person intimidate you? Does this person make you feel uncomfortable? Don't marry that type of person. You need to be yourself. Even if you're going to be your silly self. Whatever it is that you're going to be, can you be yourself around that person? That's something else you need to ask yourself. Does this person make you feel good about yourself? That's also very important. So can you be yourself, but also does that person make you feel good? Because remembering that person is going to be very close with you throughout your life. And also beware of the I'm in love syndrome. Because often I'm in love is not I'm in love, is I'm in lust. Be careful. And we find that um, many people after the first يعني, year or two, when that novelty uh, wears out, that's when the reality kicks in. So that spark okay, will become eventually just a little bit, a lot more um, uh, balanced. So be very, very careful when it comes to this. Now marriage, as I said earlier, is serious business. And there is a contract involved. And there are uh, witnesses. And there is the father of the bride, the wali. And remembering my message to the youth also, is that you cannot get married without a wali. You cannot marry without a wali. And the Prophet ﷺ, in the hadith found in Abu Dawood and Sunan al-Tirmidhi, he said, لا نكاح إلا بولي, That there is no valid marriage without a wali. There is no valid marriage without a wali. So it's not permissible for a woman to marry herself to a man without the permission of her father. And even Imam al-Bukhari in his Sahih, he has a chapter that is entitled Bab, لا نكاح إلا بولي, The chapter that there is no valid marriage except with or without a wali. And this is the opinion of the majority of the scholars, except for Abu Hanifa, rahimahullah ta'ala, which he has allowed for this, for a woman to give herself in marriage without a wali. But the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he stressed the importance of the wali. So you might be asking, okay, if my father's not alive, what happens then? If your father's not alive, then it goes to your paternal grandfather. You have to get permission from your father's father, your grandfather. If he's not around, then if um, you, you were a widow or you were divorced, your son, if he's of, over the age of puberty, um, if you don't have a son, then it becomes your brother, your forebrother, then your half-brother, then your stepbrother, etc. Your brother's uh, son, then his sons, etc. Your paternal uncles, your paternal uncle's sons, and if none of these are available, then you go to the Muslim leader. Okay? And if you are a revert or a convert, your wali becomes the imam. You can't choose your wali. You can choose an imam, a leading fig figure in the community, the head of an organization, a shaykh, a reputable shaykh who has authority, he can be your wali. But for you just to choose randomly your wali, this is not acceptable. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, وَالسُّلْطَانُ وَلِيُّ مَنْ لَا وَلِيَّ لَهَا The Sultan, the leader, is the wali of a woman who does not have a wali. So, amongst the obstacles that the youth are facing today regarding marriages are, number one, we have very high dowries or dowers whereby parents set very high dowries that make it very difficult on the boy or the young man to get married. From, and so we need to make it easy on our youth so they don't fall into zina. From amongst what makes marriage very difficult for many of our youth today are difficult walis who will only give their daughters to men of the same nationality or the same village or somebody related to them. And nationalism is not on in Islam. Islam came to get rid of, you know, um, nationalism and these 
uh, prejudices and racism. Another obstacle is parents not allowing children to get married until they complete their higher learning studies such as university or college. And maybe this was something applicable in in a, in, a, in, a, in a day and age when it comes to, when it came to many parents, but this is something very, very dangerous in this day and age. Maybe the fitna wasn't around in your time, but the fitna today is very, very evident. That if you are delaying for these reasons, and again, I see people, I see young children who are at university, who want to get married to one another, the parents even know that they are um, engaged and they give their blessing for the engagement yet they will not give their daughter in marriage and not go ahead with the marriage because I want my daughter to finish her studies I want my son to finish his studies do, do they not fear their children falling into zina wal iyadu billah so this is another another problem or I want them to save up enough money to celebrate a big wedding. I want to have a $25,000, $50,000, $100,000 wedding or else it's not on. There are some people who think like this. Um, so these type of obstacles, or I want to make sure for example that he has a car and he has a home and he has certain you know, furniture. So these sort of obstacles are going to give way to illicit relationships. They're going to give, give way to zina. And they're going to uh, give way to eloping and invalid marriages. And alhamdulillah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he, uh, he made this, He made marriage very very simple. And so, what I also want to say to the youth, if you want to get married, and you want and you have some complicated or difficult parents, then what your parents probably also want to see with you is a sense of responsibility. You need to show your parents that you are responsible. That yes, as a, as a woman, you are able to please your husband in cooking, in cleaning, in running a household, in having children. That as a husband, you are able to spend on your wife, that you know how to save money, that you are hard working, that you are responsible. The more that you can show these characteristics and these traits, the better your chances are of getting married. So you want to show maturity. You want to have a steady job. You want to show that you know, what, you know, that you know where your feet are, that you know where you are headed in life. And I also want um, the youth to be optimistic. And in the hadith that is found in Sunan al-Tirmidhi, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said three groups of people, Allah has obligated himself to help. Three groups of people, Allah will help them. Who are they? Number one, he said the mujahid, the mujahid in the, in the cause of Allah. He will help the mujahid. He said a slave to pay his debt. A slave who is in contract with his master to pay himself. He, he has entered into this contract to, and he wants to release himself from his master and he's sincere about this, Allah will help him. And the third one he said, and the one who wants to marry. And the one who wants to marry with sincerity, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will help him. And I leave the youth with this verse from the Quran. And this is from Surah An-Nur. Chapter 24 from the Quran, verse 33. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلْيَسْتَعْفِفِ الَّذِينَ لَا يَجِدُونَ نِكَاحًا حَتَّى يُغْنِيَهُمُ اللَّهُ مِنْ فَضْلِ Allah says, But let them who do not find the means of marriage abstain, in other words, be chaste by not committing zina until Allah enriches them from His bounty. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying to those who don't have the means to get married. You'd like to get married, but you don't have the money. You don't have um, the ability for whatever reason it might be. Allah is commanding you, this individual, to be chaste. Be modest. Be patient. 
In other words, do all of those things that are going to keep you modest and chaste. And if you would do this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to enrich you. How is it that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to enrich you? Allah will enrich you because you applied taqwa Allah. Because you applied the fear of Allah. And in Surah Al-Talaq, in the chapter of divorce, where Allah mentions taqwa in at least four places, Allah says, وَمَن يَتَّقِ اللَّهَ يَجْعَلْ لَهُ مَخْرَجًا وَيَرْزُقْهُ مِنْ حَيْثُ لَا يَحْتَسِبْ He said, whoever has the taqwa of Allah, Allah will provide a way out. Meaning a way out of hardship. And He will provide for him in terms of sustenance from where he least expects it. So you have a chance as a youth who is striving to be modest to become rich. You can actually end up becoming rich through the taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah will then provide a way out of your hardship. But to go and fall into haram and to go and do the haram, then you may face the opposite and you might find yourself poor. And so remember to always put your trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And have taqwa Allah so Allah can make it easy for you. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to amaze us all with His countless blessings and His bounties, to give uh, patience to our youth, to give them guidance, to give them direction. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bestow outstanding spouses to our boys and our girls, our brothers and our sisters, and to make it easy for them, and to protect them from all types of haram. Wallahu ta'ala a'lam. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabiyyina Muhammad. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.